So hello, I want to welcome everyone to a webinar hosted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications Program. My name is Matt Graybaugh. I am a science coordinator for the Southwest region of the Fish and Wildlife Service, which includes Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. I sit down here in Tucson in the Ecological Services Field Office in Tucson. We're happy to have Philip Boyd present to us today on the results of a conservation challenges prioritization effort completed by Borderlands Research Institute and partners in the Big Bend region of the Rio Grande and the U.S. and Mexico. Philip is the program coordinator for the Dos Rios Landscape Conservation Design. He earned his MS at Sol Ross State University, concentrating his thesis research on simulation models that evaluated translocation as a restoration tool for pronghorn populations in far west Texas. He now works for Borderlands Research Institute at Sol Ross State University, and he's in Alpine, Texas. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Philip. Okay, thanks, Matt, and thanks to everyone who is joining today. So as Matt mentioned, I'm the coordinator for the Dos Rios Landscape Conservation Design. Um, I've been working in this position for about the last year, and um, as coordinator, I work with several regular team members from a variety of conservation organizations in the U.S. and Mexico, and our network extends to a larger group of partners beyond uh, just the ones represented in this slide, but these are some of the key members from our coordinating team coming from um, these various agencies. So the landscape conservation design study area that was nominated uh, for us is featured on this map within the orange polygon. This area was selected because of the shared interest of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, and the Rio Conchos, which feeds into the Rio Grande, and the large areas of unfragmented land in this relatively undeveloped landscape, as well as the pr protected lands along the border, such as uh, Big Bend National Park and some of the protected areas in Mexico. As part of the landscape conservation design, um, our partners with the Dos Rios Conservation Cooperative have come up with this mission statement that the partners of the binational Dos Rios Conservation Cooperative will support one another in protecting the shared values, ecosystem services, and resources of our geography. The partners of the Dos Rios Conservation Cooperative have collaboratively, co collaboratively identified these concepts as integral to our desired future conditions, fostering collaborative conservation supporting biodiversity, connectivity for wildlife and ecological processes, and socio-ecological services, and sustainable water use. Part of the uh, objectives outlined by the landscape conservation design are to work across jurisdictional boundaries and produce tools and information that is needed by partners to leverage for funding for existing or for future efforts and for uh, to leverage resources for existing conservation efforts. Also to identify areas where socio-ecological or ecosystem services, I kind of flip-flop um, with that terminology throughout this presentation, could be improved through collaborative conservation. Uh, to identify conservation challenges or stressors in priority ecosystems, our definition for stressors comes from Salafsky et al. 2008. Stressors are the direct threats or activities and processes that cause degradation or destruction of biodiversity targets. We also want to identify areas where collaborative conservation can be prioritized and to create a management strategies toolbox to address these challenges. So today's webinar is mainly focusing on um, the ecosystem stress and um, a exercise that we shared with several partners uh, to prioritize uh, efforts to manage some of these stressors. And this exercise, uh, the, the form that we ended up sharing was brought together um, based on several previous existing efforts, some of which are li listed here, such as the Center for Environmental Cooperation's Conservation Assessment of the Big Bend, um, as well as several other documents. So these were kind of combed through and, um, and used to compile some of the information in this stressors ranking exercise. In addition to ecosystem stressors, we wanted to 
uh, as part of the landscape conservation designs mission to address ecosystem services as well and uh, and get some feedback on which ecosystem services could benefit from collaborative conservation in our region. So based on the existing documents and meeting with our coordinating team, we reached out for feedback on, on these ecosystem services, as well as feedback on what conservation practitioners are seeing as challenges in the areas of the landscape where they work. We chose three priority ecosystems, grassland, desert scrub, riparian aquatic, and montane woodland ecosystems. And then we broke each of these ecosystems into four stressor categories. So the four are habitat degradation, fragmentation, and loss, ecosystem functionality, invasive animal species, and invasive and problematic plant species. So um, also just understanding that not all invasive sp plant species are um, exotics, um, which is more or less why we use the term problematic there. Some native uh, plants have become problematic due to other st stressors on the landscape or they themselves have become stressors. So uh, we asked our participants to rank the different stressors listed within these ecosystems and ecosystem stressor categories. We asked them to rank their top three stressors currently having the most impact within the ecosystems where they work. A number, three, uh, number one ranking would imply a stressor that was having the most impact on the landscape. Number two would be a stressor having considerable impact. And number three would be a stressor having impact on the landscape. Our geography of interest for this exercise um, extended beyond just the Dos Rios landscape conservation design boundary, which is here on this map in orange. Um, keeping in mind some future planning conservation efforts that are taking place um, and some other current conservation efforts, we wanted to reach out to a broader network and a broader geography. So we included the entirety of the Chihuahuan Desert which is outlined in green here. And uh, that was a, a boundary that was downloaded from New Mexico State University. The URL is there at the bottom of the page. And we wanted to include the Trans-Pecos region of Texas, which is the far west region of Texas. That's where I live. Um, that's everything east of the Pecos River in Texas. But we also included Valverde County, Sorry, I said east, it's west of the Pecos River. Um, Valverde County is east of the Pecos River, but it sits in a similar ecoregion to the rest of the Trans-Pecos. And it also contains the Devil's River, which is of significant uh, conservation uh, focus right now, too. So that's why we included um, all of those counties in West Texas. And then all of these boundaries were merged into one larger boundary. And then um, the different municipalities in Mexico and counties within the US states were clipped to this boundary so that our geography included all municipalities and counties within that boundary. And then when we sent the exercise out, we asked the participants to choose every municipality and county where they focus their conservation work. We sent this uh, exercise out to 377 conservation, conservation professionals in the Chihuahuan Desert and within our geography. We had about roughly 60% uh, uh, participants located in the US and 40% in Mexico. Out of the 377, we had about a 41% participation rate with 158 responses and 110 completing uh, this exercise to the point where they hit the submit button at the end of the exercise. Um, but really any feedback that was given was captured by the software, regardless of if the participant had time to return and complete and hit submit. Um, 
so we did analyze every bit of feedback that we got. Our participation period ran for about six weeks from December 17th through January 31st. And we had um, all of our results were then exported from our software once the participation period was closed, uh, just exported into Microsoft Excel for analysis. Um, leading up to the closing of the participation period, we had regular weekly email reminders to those who had not yet participated so that we could try to get as many as much feedback as possible. We were able to collect some location data based on where participants were accessing this form from. 109 of those are plotted on this map so you can see the distribution of where our participation came from. Again, uh, we have about 40% of our participants were in Mexico, the aqua blue dots here, and then the red dots um, our participation in the U.S., which is about 60%. So as I mentioned earlier, um, within that geography that we had outlined, we had participants um, select all municipalities in Mexico and all counties in the three U.S. states, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, um, where they focus their conservation work. This heat map here shows where the um, highest number of participants was located. So it goes from dark green. Uh, the dark green will show the lower number of participants all the way up to the red, which has the higher number of participants. Just for sake of uh, visual clarity, I didn't label every single municipality and county here. But at some point when we share this data uh, a little more broadly, we'll include um, a table so that you can see all the county names and the number of participants. We can see our three highest, um, our counties with the highest amount of participation were three in Texas, El Paso County, Presidio County, and Brewster County. But then there were a considerable amount of counties in orange and, uh, and yellow as well. So pretty good distribution across the geography. And then this theme will carry forward with some of the other results that I'll be talking about later um, as far as the heat map goes, but I'll go into further detail about that in a couple minutes. I'll leave this up here for a second so you can see if you want to look just where some of the participation was coming from. Okay, so moving on to our results, I'm just going to go over a couple um, housekeeping items here. So going forward, I'm going to be presenting two types of graphics. One is going to be a bar chart or column chart, and the other will be a heat map like the one I just showed. The bar chart represents the number of times that a particular service or conservation challenge stressor was chosen as the number one stressor in that ecosystem category. So within each ecosystem and stressor category, um, this is going to show just the number of times that that particular stressor received the number one ranking, so the number of tallies for um, the number one ranking there. And then all available stressors will be listed in that bar chart. And we're also going to show a second type of graphic, which will be the heat map. This is the pooled results of the top one, two, or three stressors for each ecosystem and stressor category. So each time a participant chose one of the stressors within the top one, two, or three rankings, then the counties where that participant identified as areas where they work would also receive a tally. And then I plotted that on this map here so we can see where um, the highest percentage of participants from each municipality and county were also nominating this particular stressor as a top one, two, or three stressor. The green colors will represent um, per uh, percentages below 25%. The red will represent a higher percentage of greater than 75% of participants from that municipality or county ranking that particular stressor as 
a top one, two, or three stressor. So again, this is the pooled results. And this just goes into a little bit of background on how that was done once again. So the results were exported in Microsoft Excel. Each participant was represented by a single row in the Excel file. And um, on that top graphic there, you can see, for instance, um, all the counties in Texas where the participants were saying where they worked. And then next to that, you see the number one ranking for uh, desert grassland habitat degradation. And so anytime a, st a stressor was nominated in these three columns that represented the one, two, or three ranking, then the um, associated counties where that participant worked would get a tally. Now we did have some counties or municipalities that had a low number of total participants reporting from those areas. So just a disclaimer, these um, graphics are not, or these maps are not adjusted for a small sample size. Um, so just be aware of that. But for instance, in Allende municipality there under the, above the red arrow, you can see that we had three total participants from, uh, from that municipality. And two tallies for desertification. So that works out to 67% of participants from Allende choosing desertification as a top three stressor. But also, we didn't have single digit participation from every county. This is just an example to show you uh, that we did have some small sample sizes. But again, that earlier map shows where the, um, the highest amount of participation was from. And we hope to make this data available in a table form at a later point in time. OK, so moving on to the first section of this ranking exercise or prioritization effort, we looked at ecosystem services. So these are some actual results from this exercise. So this question that was posed to our participants was, which ecosystem service or socio-ecological service would benefit most from collaborative conservation? And so this is a bar chart, so it represents just the number of tallies that these stressors, um, or these, sorry, these ecosystem services received as the number one ranked ecosystem service that could benefit from collaborative conservation. And you can see by far and away that availability of water had the highest um, tallies as far as being ranked as the number one service the most times with 50. And then recreational or ecotourism opportunities came in second with 18, economics for wildlife management around 16, ecosystem function education around 14. And just going down the list, so if you did not participate in the actual exercise, some of the other options um, that we had made available to participants were rainwater catchment, management case study access, flood control, wastewater processing, and improved drinking water systems. So moving on to the pooled results. So um, looking just at availability of water, we can see where in the landscape our participation was coming from and where the highest percentage of participants were ranking availability of water as a top one, two, or three ecosystem service that could benefit from collaborative conservation. So when we start throwing um, these results on the heat map, it starts showing um, differences in where on the landscape some of these issues are higher priority. So all of West Texas in this case had above 50% um, participants, uh, percentage of participants from all the counties in West Texas. Um, ranking availability of water as a top one, two, or three ecosystem service that could benefit from collaborative conservation. And then all of um, New Mexico and Arizona counties that were included, as well as several municipalities in Mexico saw this as a, a need, uh, a service that could benefit from collaborative conservation. And we'll scroll through here to the next service. So ecosystem function education. Um, 
maybe not as intense of a high per, uh, percentage of participants ranking ecosystem service or sorry ecosystem function education as a top one two or three ecosystem service but pretty broadly between 25 and 49.99 percent of participants from each of these municipalities or counties ranked ecosystem function education as a top one, two, or three ecosystem service that could benefit from collaborative conservation. This map showing economics for wildlife management, again, top one, two, or three ecosystem service that could benefit from collaborative conservation. And recreation or ecotourism opportunities, top one, two, or three ecosystem service that could benefit from collaborative conservation, the percentage of participants from each county and municipality who saw recreation ecotourism opportunities as a top three ecosystem service. And I'll just toggle back through here, all four of them, so we can see them in comparison to another uh, one another once again. Okay, so that wraps up that first section of this exercise, and we're going to move on to um, one of the ecosystems today. We'll go over the results more. Um, we had, as I mentioned earlier, we had three ecosystems, grassland, desert scrub, riparian aquatic, and montane woodlands. Um, we, we combined some of these ecosystems, for instance, desert grasslands and desert scrub, um, just because some desert scrub lands were formerly desert grasslands, and um, they faced some of the same challenges. Um, I'm not going to go over every single ecosystem today because we would run out of time, but I'm going to go into some depth here with our results from the grassland section. Okay, so we're looking at a column or bar chart here. Uh, once again, just a reminder, this shows the number of times that the available uh, stressor options were ranked number one. So this is only showing the number one ranking tallies for each stressor within desert grassland, desert scrub, habitat degradation, fragmentation, and loss. So unsustainable grazing here had the highest number of uh, number one rankings with around 36. Conversion to agriculture was around 26. Desertification was around 21. Shrub encroachment around 12. Energy development, so pipelines, increased road use, wind turbines, and so on and so forth, degrading or fragmenting the landscape uh, around 11. Over exploitation or harvest of plants for commercial value, so cactus, um, agave, uh, yucca, those types of things being removed. Around three, and then structures that inhibit wildlife movement, so fencing and roads, uh, just had one, one tally here as the number one stressor. And we'll move on and look at um, the top stressors here in the pooled results plotted as a heat map. So looking here at unsustainable grazing, the percentage of participants ranking unsustainable grazing as a top one, two, or three grasslands, habitat, degradation, fragmentation, and loss stressor. You can see this was um, a, a big issue for some of our participants reporting from municipalities in Mexico. We have several there uh, between 75 and 100% who see this as a problem. And, um, and then throughout the Trans-Pecos, we have um, between 50 and 74.99% there in the orange color and several counties in the Trans-Pecos, Texas as well. And we'll move on to conversion to agriculture. So not as much of a problem uh, according to our participants in West Texas. Um, but then as you move further south in some of the Mexican municipalities, this appears to be a concern for conservation professionals in that region. So the percentage of participants ranking 
conversion to agriculture as a top three grassland habitat degradation, fragmentation, and loss stressor. This map depicts the percentage of participants ranking shrub encroachment as a top one, two, or three grasslands habitat degradation, fragmentation, and loss stressor. So in contrast to, I believe it was unsustainable grazing earlier, uh, shrub encroachment seems to be an issue in those same counties in West Texas. And then we have a lot of counties and municipalities in yellow. Shrub encroachment also seems to be an issue in western New Mexico and eastern Arizona. And desertification, per percentage of participants ranking it as a top three grassland habitat degradation, fragmentation, and loss stressor. So again, the idea, just toggling back through here so we can see where some of the contrast is, um, is just be able to maybe prioritize some of these areas where people are reporting back that these are concerns that they run into with their conservation efforts on the ground in the counties and municipalities that they identified as areas where they worked. Okay, moving on to our next category. This was ecosystem functionality for desert grasslands, desert scrub. Um, and this is a bar chart, so we're just looking at the number of tallies that each available stressor received in the number one ranking. So here, increased drought had the most uh, number one ranking tallies followed by soil degradation, soil salinization, conversion to agriculture, fire suppression, and then as we start to get in the smaller uh, columns here, increased frequency of heat events, lack of water sources for wildlife due to ill-maintained or out of commission wells, increased frequency and intensity of storms causing flood events. Okay, so we're on to the heat maps here. So these, again, are the pooled results of one, two, or three rankings for each individual stressor. Percentage of participants ranking increased drought as a top three grasslands ecosystem functionality stressor. So uh, where they're seeing this stressor having an impact on the landscape in terms of ecosystem functionality was pretty broadly between 50 and 74.99% among all available options for municipalities and counties where conservation professional participants were working. And uh, looks like a very uh, big area of concern in New Mexico and Arizona as well. So soil degradation and salinization. So percentage of participants ranking soil degradation, salinization as a top one, two, or three grassland ecosystem functionality stressor. A big problem in a lot of um, municipalities in Mexico, as well as the entirety of the Trans-Pecos and a large portion of the New, Me New Mexican and Arizona counties as well. Conversion to agriculture. Percentage of participants ranking conversion to agriculture as a top one, two, or three grasslands ecosystem functionality stressor um, doesn't appear to be as big of a concern in West Texas as it does in several counties or municipalities in Mexico. Increased frequency of heat events as a top one, two, or three stressor to ecosystem functionality in grasslands, pretty broadly between 25 and 49.99 percent of participants from um, a, a majority of our counties and municipalities here rank that. Fire suppression. So percentage of participants ranking fire suppression as a 
one, two, or three grasslands ecosystem functionality stressor. Okay, moving on to our third uh, stressor category within the grasslands. This is looking at invasive, sorry, invasive animal species. So these are the number of tallies for the stressor having the most impact, the number one ranking. Feral hogs had 40. Trespassed livestock, about 33. Barbary sheep, or aldad, as they're also called, around 16. Tallies in the number one spot. Eurasian collar dove, ringneck dove, pigeon, about five. Feral burros, uh, just one or two. And then we'll look at each of these again on the landscape. Feral hogs, so percentage of participants ranking feral hogs as a top one, two, or three stressor. And in contrast, trespass livestock as a one, two, or three stressor. Barbary sheep or Audad, percentage of participants ranking as a top three grassland invasive animal species. And feral burrows. So I only made the heat maps for the stressors that um, had the pool, uh, the highest amount of pooled totals for one, two, or three rankings. So I believe Feral Burroughs had the fewest amount of number one tallies, but then when you combine the one, two, and three ranking tallies, it actually um, got bumped up a little bit and warranted a heat map. Okay, and this is our last category that we'll go over today. Um, this is invasive or problematic plant species. Okay, we're looking at the, um, again, number one rankings here, the number of times that each of these uh, species were voted the number one stressor having the most impact on grasslands or desert scrub ecosystems. So mesquite and creosote came in right around 25. Mesquite slightly edging out creosote there. And moving on, um, buffalo grass, Layman love grass were third and fourth, respectively. When we plot these as heat maps, we can see where um, participants are working and also ranking these as a top one, two, or three concern. So this first map here is looking at creosote. And then we'll move on to mesquite. So it looks a little more the intense here, the percentage of participants ranking mesquite as a top one, two, or three grasslands invasive plant species. And buffalo grass, not as much of a problem in Transpecus as it is in eastern Arizona, western New Mexico, some of the western municipos in Mexico. and Lehman lovegrass. So I'll just scroll back through these four once again so we can just see them in uh, comparison to one another. So Lehman lovegrass, buffalo grass, mesquite, creosote. Okay, so that's it for the results that I'll be going over today, just for the sake of time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did collect feedback on riparian and aquatic ecosystems, as well as montane woodlands. And we hope to um, wrap all of this up in, into a final report and to make a lot of this data available, both in table form and um, 
with some of the sp spatial components that we shared today with, uh, with some of these heat maps as well. Um, we talked about rolling these into some sort of interactive data explorer and a story map. So um, we'll be working on that in the next couple months and maybe further on uh, for the rest of the year. But our immediate next steps are to look at compiling strategies to address some of the priority stressors that were uh, identified by our participants. And so we'll be following up with um, some outlines where we'll be looking at strategies and existing resources on those strategies. Um, we'll be following up with our participants for feedback on additional strategies that may exist, um, research and monitoring needs that may exist, and examples of um, on-the-ground strategies that are happening um, that they may know about. So, and this will feed into our management strategy toolbox that we'll be constructing. We also, with the Desert LCC, have the CCAST tool that is already published. Uh, CCAST stands for Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. So the URL for that is listed below the thumbnail of the, of the tool itself here. So if you have not visited that, you can visit that and you can already start navigating through some of the existing case studies that are out there for some of these management strategies. Um, the one that's highlighted on that map that I took a photo of is one down in our region looking at riparian woodland and grassland restorations to increase resiliency to drought. Uh, but you can navigate through the various topics and stressors to find management strategies that you may be interested in. So that's a tool that already exists and we'll be looking to feed into that some more as well. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. Um, our contact info is here. If you have any questions about CCAST or the landscape conservation design, um, you can contact Matt. If you have any questions about the stressors ranking uh, or prioritization effort that I went over today, you can reach me at the Borderlands Research Institute in Alpine, Texas at Sol Ross State University, and my email address is on the screen here as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Matt, and we'll field any questions you may have. And thanks again. Yep, thank you, Philip. Um, Philip, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I want to start by thanking Philip uh, for giving us you know, some pretty detailed, intense results here for Monday morning, but thank you for uh, going through it with us. Um, sure. As a reminder, um, if you have questions you'd like to ask about the presentation or anything we touched on in here, you need to do that through the chat box. Um, so if you can't see the group chat right now, uh, if you hover over the video screen, uh, you'll see the toolbar pop up, and the group chat icon is second from the left, so you can type in questions. Uh, so if you click on the group chat, You'll see the chat box and you can type in questions there for me to relay. Um, so I'll give folks a minute for that. And in the meantime, you know, I wanted to talk just for a second about some of the key takeaways I took from this effort. Um, I think there was a lot of existing work out there where we kind of knew what the challenges were across the landscape. I think a lot of the overall results are not too much of a surprise. Uh, but to me, what was really interesting is being able to see uh, the difference between some of the challenges that are really ubiquitous across the landscape, so like feral hogs appear to be a pretty big challenge across the entire geography, but some were more localized, and uh, trespass cattle is the one that I pulled up just as we were going through there, so it seems like this could be a really useful action or useful data set to be able to prioritize where conservation actions uh, should be put on the landscape and which type, so that was really cool. Um, and I don't need to blabber on about that too much more. Um, so we'll get to uh, questions if you have those. And uh, the first question we have here is, uh, Philip, for you. Um, considering that the participation period was mostly during the US federal government shutdown, um, do you think that may have limited the response that we got from US federal employees? Uh, yeah, that was a concern of ours, um, I think. The shutdown started on the 19th or the 20th. I, I can't remember exactly, but we we did get it out a few days before that, and then um, 
we kept it open longer than um, than we had originally planned. I also can't remember off the top of my head. I'm, Matt, I'm sure you would know when the shut out, uh, shutdown ended. What day was that? First. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the 21st. Please. Um, so we did have, that, that was a concern, but for the sake of time, we also had to push forward. Um, so we kept it open for six weeks, which was longer than we initially planned. Um, but we do have a relatively condensed timeline to, f to finish some of this. So we just had to roll on with, um, with the results that we could get in that six week period. But yeah, it was unfortunate timing. Obviously, with the holiday too, um, but that's why we let it go for most of January as well. And we did get a lot of feedback right off the bat when we first sent it out. We, we had pretty good participation right up front. Right. Yeah, and uh, Philip alluded to this too, but we have a condensed timeline to try to wrap up the landscape conservation design, at least in terms of what we can do right now. Um, because we're pushing to really get this done. Philip, what's the latest on the timeline within the next couple of months, you said? Yeah, I mean, for my position actually is going through the end of May and maybe into June some. So we're really trying to wrap up as much as we can with what we have. Um, there may be some work that we can do beyond that, but um, but that's what I'm working with as coordinator right now. So that was really a, a, a big driver for trying to get as much feedback in that amount of time that we could. Thanks, Philip. Um, just double checking. I'm not seeing any additional questions right now. Uh, if anybody has questions they'd like to put in the chat box, please do. Um, also thought we could try to flip this a little bit. Uh, Philip, did you have any questions you'd like to ask the attendees on the webinar? I know we talked a little bit about trying to figure out how to best present the data, um, just something that comes to mind. Are there any other questions you'd like to ask that? Yeah, I'd, that would be useful. Um, as I mentioned, we're trying to, uh, you know, we're going to try to wrap this up in the next couple of months. But, um, you know, if you think just looking at this, you know, I know it's the first glance for, for a lot of our participants, but if there are better ways that you can think of displaying some of these results, we've, you know, we've narrowed them down to the bar chart and the heat map for now, but um, we're, we're open to suggestions. Also, um, the small sample size disclaimer was an issue that has arisen in previous uh, efforts. I, I was having with discussions with some of our team members um, how to address that better, you know, um, other than just giving as much information as we can, whether that's in table form or with that map that shows where the number of participants were concentrated. Um, if that's good enough with, with the disclaimer, then that's good enough. But I guess any suggestions on how to address that would be useful as well. And you know, any feedback, um, we want this to be a useful tool. As you mentioned, Matt, some of your takeaways from it, um, even though there are some of these existing efforts and uh, existing understanding of what we're being, what we're seeing on the landscape, you know, you were still able to take some things away from this. So um, we want it to be useful. So really any feedback on ways to make it more useful would be helpful. Okay, thanks, Philip. Yeah, so we can put that out there. If you have anything you'd like to suggest in the chat box in terms of uh, presentation or how you think we might be able to tweak the results of this to make it uh, be something useful for for you or your agency, uh, feel free to let us know either now or um, again follow up with Philip. Of course, this is a lot of information to take in, um, and even as we look at the results, flipping through the maps, um, yeah, there's a lot to go through. Um, and they're about, this is only about 30% of the results as well. So, you know, we have an, the additional two ecosystems. Um, but, you know, I, we'll have discussions about how to make this data available. I think if it's in table form or, you know, Excel form or something, then at some point too, then um, there may be the opportunity for people to use it, you know, the way they see fit as well. But this is what we've come up with for now. Uh, Philip, we do have uh, one question from, from Jack. Uh, so in some examples, there were some pretty significant differences between priorities on the U.S. versus Mexican sides. Do you have any sense of whether there's more convergence across the border regarding the riparian concerns? 
Um, you know, I would have to consult my... I do have a sense in that I've been uh, going over these results for a while now, but um, just in my preparation for the presentation, I was mainly focusing here on the grasslands one. But let me see if I can bring it up. I, I know that we do have a lot of similar um, uh, kind of changes across the, the landscape there as you flip through some of the results for the riparian um, in addition to grasslands here. Let me, this is offline, but I'm just going to bring up some results here and try to describe them to you. Hopefully that's okay. Um, bear with me one second. Okay, so yeah, I, you know, looking at um, habitat fragmentation in the riparian area, um, for instance, uh, pollution from herbicide, you know, isn't a big issue in most of West Texas, whereas pollution of aquifers from mining and energy development um, or pollution of streams from energy development discharge of untreated wastewater. Some of these, yeah, there are different, definitely differences on the landscape in a similar fashion to the stressors that you saw from the grasslands today um, as you go through the riparian results as well. Um, as far as between the U.S. and Mexico, I can't really say if, if there are any different, um, you know, feral hogs may be a bigger issue in Mexico slightly. Um, giant cane it was nominated as a, a huge issue in West Texas. Um, all, almost all of West Texas was bright red, whereas Mexico was in the orange, which is between 50 and 74.99 percent. The red is 75 to 100. So there's another discrepancy between the two countries. Um, same with salt cedar. Yeah, I could probably go on all day, but uh, um, but I think it's it's pretty similar to the grasslands results that we shared today, in the sense that it's you know that there's variation on the landscape. Thanks, Philip. Um, any other last minute questions? Okay, uh, it's more of a comment, also, Philip. Uh, it's just a thanks, and we look forward to seeing uh, those detailed results too. So, yeah, thanks for hosting and thanks to everyone who uh, was able to attend today and ask questions as well. Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Um, as a reminder, the webinar was recorded. We'll make it available on YouTube once we have time to process it and get it uploaded. Uh, you can access the channel on the Desert Landscape Conservation Center website, which is desertlcc.org. Um, you can also find it by just searching for Desert LCC in YouTube. So with that, I'll thank everyone one last time and hope you have a great day.